Kia ora koutou katoa, welcome to the Tuanes Zoom webinar, the first one of our series. And um, today we have the wonderful Garth Baker who will be introducing um, our webinar today. So before further ado, we'll get started. Okay. Oh, well, hi mine, welcome. Thanks for this opportunity to get together and uh, talk about uh, some effective things that we can do to involve men a lot more in preventing sexual violence. So uh, my name is Garth Baker and uh, I've been working particularly on this issue in terms of violent prevention and particularly about targeting men for the last 10 years, but really it actually uh, builds on work that was done 35 years ago. This, Started off uh, one of my early jobs as the first male educator for family planning, and then was involved with the research on a program about men's sexuality. So, really interested in these issues. Um, and that really came from my experience of you know, going to university in the 70s, and where feminism was a lot of the conversation, and it really connected with the values that I've been brought up with in the Methodist Church. So. That's a bit about how come I get to be here. Emma Longer Whakapapa is back to uh, English, Scottish and Portuguese people, uh, working class people coming to New Zealand for better life. And, uh, and I've lived uh, with my partner in a house on a hill in Wellington for now over half my life. And part of that is uh, it's a great view out and when I first shifted there, it had a great view out of the hills covered with gorse. And what I've seen is the native trees come back through there. And in the last 10 years, I've been really actively involved in planting more trees to help that along. So, is that sense of over time we can change things? Uh, nature's changing and evolving, but we can also promote that. So, things that we're going to be uh, doing today. Uh, I want to talk a bit about the uh, outline of the session. Do I this? Right. So I want to talk about the setting and the key approaches uh, that we're going to cover and we kind of frame up the uh, presentation. Also want to be talking about uh, motivation that men have that we can draw on to bring them in. And also, we'll be focusing on particular behaviour, so that's a really strong feature of this. So we really want to get to that. What's the actual behaviour we want men to be doing? And we also want to spend some time talking about the strategies that are going to connect with men and promote that behaviour directly to them. So uh, one of the other things is you'll see. Oh, and then we'll have time at the end for questions and discussion. So as we go along, please get on that chat and put in the questions and comments so that we've got that richness here as well. Uh, also, you'll see on the bottom of some of the slides uh, quotes uh, from a recent last week article in The Guardian uh, by Tim Winton, who's an Australian author very powerful piece about boys and masculinity and where things are at. And uh, I'm, a, I'm a great fan of Tim Winton, but it was such a powerful uh, piece that in fact I've uh, got that in. And that's one of the resources that you can have. And at the end of the presentation, there's a list of I think four or five resources. And that's one of them and well worth reading that. And of course, yeah, there's other books which are a lot about masculinity particularly in Australia. Uh, so let's move on. Um, what I'll be talking about is primary prevention. So it's things that we can do before violence occurs. Some of the ideas that I've got are great for working with perpetrators, but the focus really is on that group of men in a population basis, and particularly on reducing down the risk factors uh, for violence and increasing the protection factors. So it's that overall what we can do beforehand early on with groups. So the primary prevention approach. Um, the information that's in this presentation has come 
from a family violence clearinghouse issue papers, which is about involving men in violence prevention, and that I wrote with them. Uh, and this is really what gives the context. And so that's a sound research base of what we're doing, but also I really pushed it in terms of getting down to the particular behavior, so a lot more applied. Internationally, there's a real move to engage men in a range of social and health issues, and that includes preventing gender violence. And in terms of that, the overarching uh, value is really about being pro-feminist and supporting gender equity. That's the key sort of value base of this work. Uh, and internationally, there's two clear trends that are emerging. One is a lot of work around changing men's social norms, and we'll be talking more particularly about that. And the other key action area that's happening is around a gender transformative approach and looking to change men's ideas and behaviours about what it is to be a man. That's internationally, uh, and that's really the basis of what I framed up this presentation. And we're talking particularly around those two things. Uh, the other key point I want to make is I've really focused in on the behaviour that we want. And that comes from a clear approach in social marketing, which is that if you focus on changing people's behaviour rather than their attitudes, then they will and that we're likely to get early behaviour change because people will change their attitudes to match their behaviour rather than the other way around. So focus of keeping it real and concrete, which is one of the key strategies also for involving men. Uh, one of the other big models that keeps coming through the primary prevention, which is really helpful for framing up the risk and the protection factors for any form of violence, is the ecological models. So that sense of the individual has some factors. Then there's social network, which is the whānau, peers, out of the community, and things that happen in societal level. And really our focus today is right at that individual level and the social environment. And that fits because you've got the gender transformation for the individual, but then also that focus around men's social norms, which is how the uh, social environment, your immediate circles affects their behavior. And so that's our focus and where it fits within the model. Um, key approaches. Let's start off talking about men's social norms. This is really how our social situation affects behaviour. And a social norm is essentially the behaviour that's considered acceptable for a member of a particular group. So that's, it governs behaviour as individuals tend to conform with the norm of the group that they identify with. So that sense of being, this is who I am and this is how people like me behave, so I behave like that. Very powerful, and we can spend a lot of time on that alone, but it's relevant today because the social norms are particularly influential on men, particularly around their ideas about what's the right way to be a man and the privilege that men like me should have. So some real key factors right there. Uh, the norms are a powerful driver of behaviour, uh, but typically men actually read them wrong. So there's that sense of they're powerfully influenced by it, but actually not accurate. So for example, uh, most men assume that more other men use violence and actually do. So you can see that if you're prone to using violence, this gives a social sanction for doing it. And it also means that if men don't use violence and don't support it, then they feel that they're in a minority, so at least likely to speak out and stand out. Another thing in terms of the norm that sort of shines through is that one of the biggest factors uh, of whether an individual uh, man will intervene to stop violence is whether he thinks other men will also intervene. Um, and typically assumes that they wouldn't, so holds back himself. So you can see that the social norms are important, but often they're quite distorted. 
So the graphic there is a cloud of words from a discussion about healthy masculinity. So you can see there uh, some useful words. And you could imagine if uh, you had a discussion with a group of men, what a word cloud like that would be if you were talking about unhealthy masculinity. Uh, the other key approach is around that gender transformation. And so it's really what we're wanting to do is reframe the masculine identity, how we do masculinity here. So it's critical questions, challenging assumptions, particularly around roles, behavior, and power. Uh, and it's this sort of transformation with a goal of wanting to promote more flexible, equitable identities and behaviours. You can also see at the bottom there a quote by Tim Winton again, and he uses the expression uh, toxic masculinity, which is an expression which is getting some increasing use. And it's useful uh, in, because it describes the traditional male behaviour and the negative effect that it has, the toxic impact on others. And it also encapsulates the negative effect on the individual man. So toxic for others and for the man. So it's a useful way to frame up that traditional masculinity and the impact on other people. Easy, I think a sort of slight warning is to always use it and to define it and define it as something that all men are affected by. So it's not just extreme perpetrators, it's actually something that touches all of us and affects how we behave. So that gender transformation is really about addressing those kind of issues. Um, some local examples here would be the Gender Equal New Zealand project that is just getting going. Uh, and just last week produced an interesting research report about attitudes around masculinity and how much men should be treated differently or have different roles than women. So that's one of the graphics there. Uh, another key thing uh, is a project that was involved in last year for White Ribbon, the Raise Our Men film. Powerful interviews with New Zealand men where they're talking especially about their experience, how that affected their behaviour, and also about their choice to choice to change and to become who they want to. So great resource, and again, there's a flyer for that in the list of resources that you'll get. Uh, so there's a gender transformative approach coming through in both of those. It's motivation that men have that we can really draw on and to involve them. And really, I think we need to kind of connect with that as a way to get that invitation for them to become involved. And uh, one of the key things is when men become aware of the impact of violence on women that they care for. So it's empathy, uh, which of course is one of the early casualties of tox toxic masculinity. So it should be an early focus of gender transformation about building up that compassionate action and concern. The other thing that we can also draw on is that every man will have ne negative experiences of other men's aggression or toxic expression of masculinity. So there's actually personal experiences that we can then build on and reframe in terms of empathy for others to motivate non-violent, respectful, healthy masculinity, however you want to talk about what we want instead of violence. Another key sort of motivation for men is around the personal values and ethics. And that be, could be cultural or religious beliefs. And for example, in terms of te kanga Māori, there's nothing that supports the use of violence against women. Hurting and damaging women is totally inconsistent with valuing whakapapa. So right there, you've got a key cultural value that actually is a protection against violence that you can really build on to invite men in that hold those values. And if we look, like the key tenets of the major religions are all peaceful, respectful, 
non-violence. There's no explicit endorsement for violence from men against women. So touching on those values, sometimes reframing them is a good way to get them involved. The other kind of key thing that we want to be uh, working on is promoting the benefits of men transforming their gender views. And what's clear is that men that have done that have better, more satisfying relationships, including sexual relationships, and they also have greater personal contentment and happiness and mental health. There are some really attractive things that we could be promoting to get men involved. And I'm mindful that some of you are involved in facilitating mates and dates programs. So working with teenage men. Um, and so there's some immediate benefits, I think, of promoting gender transformation to men, which is that they're more likely to have more and better sex because women are going to trust them and will have a more satisfying experience with them there. So immediate behavior gain right at that key developmental stage. So that's sort of motivation that we can draw on. So the graphic there is a resource from family planning and uh, isn't love versus control. We've got some particular things there, but I think the key standout statement for me is the one two thirds of the way down, be true to yourself the sense of being congruent with your values and expressing that in your uh, The toolbox for men that uh, I've been involved in developing for white ribbon around respectful sexual relationships. You can see right there has that thing, you want to be a good guy, right? You want to treat your partner with respect. So again, same sort of message that builds on those motivations to get involved. There's solid, research showing what works to actually engage men. A key thing is about inviting them in rather than indicting their uh, behavior. So, and it also needs to be a, a positive invitation and uh, needs to be in a safe situation and needs to avoid the sort of guilt, shame, fear things. So it's that positive thing and it's an invitation and I think a key thing is to distinguish between the man and his behavior. And we want to give examples. So again, that thing of the behavior base, keeping it concrete, examples of what we want. And we want to also strengthen what are the current positive behaviors. And we also want to build on their sense of responsibility, supportive values, and a predisposition to act positively. Those are the things that come through consistently that actually connect and make that difference for getting men involved. So here's some examples uh, of different violent prevention approaches for men. Uh, Make you move Missoula uh, in Montana in the US. A invitation, uh, information rather for men, the difference between flirting and harassment and a, another US initiative, which is mystrength.org, around not hurting. So you can see there, there's three different approaches that all look to engage men in different ways. So moving on, uh, some other key things uh, that we need to be really mindful of is about the diversity of men and responding to that. We will take our identity from a range, distinguishing features, class, ethnicity, culture, location, interests, age, and really we need to connect with that in a more, in a meaningful way. And we really also need to acknowledge that male privilege isn't shared equally amongst men and we all have a different experience of that. So for example, the, the poster for Pacific Dead, so ethnic based, but also a social role right there. And I think it's also key that we uh, reflect the individual man's culture and that it has that local identity. So think about the uh, social norm, which is about identifying the group that men belong to. That's likely to have a real cultural component and to be local so that we need to connect with that so we can include them. And in terms of marketing, it means we also need to have a whole diversity of message and uh, different sorts of messages. So 
might be well it might be the same message but it gets delivered by different people in different ways to get that cultural and get that local connection here's some other examples of long prevention for men so that uh, lower one and us one there you can choose to be the man you become uh, another family planning resource is about mana so again a cultural value based in Tikanga, but I think also has a real New Zealand Aotearoa feel to it. And uh, this is a t-shirt here, which is one of my favorite violent prevention messages from Amakura, which was a, a violent prevention initiative of Iwi up north. So a man, mana is based on manaki tanga, so caring for other people. So again, you've got that in terms of value, and how you treat other people as being the key thing. And also a good example of bilingual pun that we don't often get. So that, you know, great message, local for, in terms of being up north, but actually is something that uh, is a real connection with men in the whole country, I think. Okay, let's get on to what are the uh, key behaviors that we want. And I started writing these down and ended up with a top 10, which is kind of new in terms of getting that applied, but it's all, that it makes a lot of sense and build on a lot of things. And we'll see as we go through and talk about each one that they connect with that motivation and connect that to uh, approaches in terms of social norms and gender transforming. So the first one is around being responsible for yourself. And I wondered about whether to talk about it as being aware of issues, but in fact, it, uh, we need to keep it on a focus on having self-awareness, but turning that into action. And I use the word responsibility in terms of it's about responding to other people, but it's also choosing your action. So it has that being responsible for what you then do. Uh, and this is a real contrast with toxic behavior, which is typically denying and defeating. So it's a sense of taking in things and then choosing how to react to that. The second behavior, was in, which I call choosing your own gender by actions. So there's that sense of choosing what you do, seeing gender as a choice rather than a prescription that's set in stone. We want to encourage more flexible behavior so men aren't just doing what they expect men to do, but are actually choosing to do what's right for them and their relationships. And you'll notice I use the expression there about out of the man box. So that's one of the key descriptions that's kind of come through good shorthand to describe that sense of what are the things that limit men and which tend to encapsulate that toxic masculinity, traditional masculinity, whatever you want to talk about it. So useful shorthand and a good way if you start talking about that as a way to kind of in, in bring that into the conversation and use it as a way to promote people, prompt behavior. Now, I've also got a little graphic there, which is the one example that could be um, could be getting men out of the man box so that real men wear pink. I certainly agree wearing pink is a one flexible action. Now, in fact, you know, a long time ago, I had a little social marketing campaign where buttons made, which was uh, pink is for boys too. Uh, but really, I put that example in there about the real men uh, because what it is is about. Um, it's reinforcing that men need to be masculine. So we, what we're really wanting them to do is to de-invest and move away from having so much tied up with that, that expression of masculinity. So one example would be an exercise that you could do with a bunch of guys would be to list what is behavior of a real man and what is behavior of a good man. And you'll notice real differences right there. So if you saw that tank, the, the baby top being you know, good men wear pink, there's quite a different message 
rather than the real mean which ties them back to that narrow mean box. So it's about messaging really there. Other behavior, we want men to be equitable and fair in their actions. So it's that promotion of gender equity is a key part of that, but also about how they treat people who are different from them. So it's about valuing the individual and not making assumptions around the gender. And not assuming uh, that they've got a greater privilege just because they're a man. In fact, we want men to be aware of the comparative privilege that they live with. We also want uh, men to be modeling flexible behavior and doing that publicly and privately. So it seems to be consistent, but also being happy and comfortable in themselves that they can do that in front of other men. And so they're not fearful of other men doing the gender policing and getting, forcing the man box onto them. So that sense of being flexible and willing to do that publicly. And of course, that's going to um, promote a positive social norm. So examples of that, uh, there's a graphic there about promoting promoting uh, men being active fathering, and also another one from uh, Sonki Justice, which is a social action organization in South Africa who does a lot around gender violence. So a powerful image, men caring and being empathetic, and then they also give some information about men respect being a woman, taking care of himself, uh, and then a man knows that the choices that he makes today will be affecting the man that he is tomorrow. Strong messages. So, number five on the top list is around that developing that empathy and framing it up as compassionate action. So, having that feeling of concern, connection, but also turning it into, well, how do you express that and how do you show that? And uh, that's key to preventing violence, but it's also a, you know, a key uh, competency behavior for having close, satisfying, supportive relationships with women, but also with male mates. So a key thing that moves away from that toxic masculinity and is a foundation for building a lot of healthy behavior. Uh, we also want men to have values which oppose sexual violence and that they express that and that they see that um, violence compromises their values and who they consider they are, so their identity. And holding those values will prevent the individual's violence, but also expressing them is going to prevent the violence by other people as well. So that sense you're calling out behaviour is a key thing. So again, uh, Brothers for Life, which is another South African campaign, and also another US campaign about where do you stand. We want men to express where they stand and where their values are. Uh, we also want men to promote what a positive social norm. So that's behaviour which is going to prevent violence so that they exemplify that and do that publicly and uh, some examples that we've got for example there's a resource about be more date don't abuse and you'll see around the outside uh, key words fun humorous happy intimate fulfilling romantic positive behavior that we want uh, another local resource there, which is around the um, uh, similar sort of thing in terms of how to treat your partner of care. So 52 days and odd years for doing that, a building relationship. Uh, we also want, and I've touched on this a few times, men to actively in, intervene with other men. Now, that key strategy of getting mobilising men as bystanders is a key thing. So standing up, speaking out. And really that involves moving well outside the man box to do that. So it's, that's an approach that you used a lot. So again, Make Your Move Missoula right there has these series of posters there which 
connecting with their target audience. A video that gives information about how many can do that. And another toolbox from White Ribbon around that step up, stop violence, and take other measures. And so that would be a good useful resource if you're looking for ideas about how to do that and practical action to do that. Number nine, that sense of seeking consent, a key violent prevention strategy that's consistent in terms of preventing sexual violence, but also increasingly that focus on getting enthusiastic consent. So it lifts the bar, not just getting no, but actually getting a yes explanation mark as a key requirement for any sexual activity is crucial. So we need the man to be aware of other people's rights, his responsibility, and to be seeking a positive sexual experience for all. And uh, that comes through, you can see here, uh, again, at my strength campaign, uh, the top one there, which is, uh, this year's focus of the Make You Move Missoula campaign, and you can see it's right there in terms of consent, 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 and framing up consent as a word for sex. Great strategy. And uh, there's again the toolbox uh, from White Ribbon, which is for young men, is a start with respect, and kind of that we develop that little useful acronym there. So looking to engage. Be positive about sex and do it in a way that gives men a clear steer about what we want from them. And number 10 is we want also want men to be critical of pornography and see that it is a pretense to understand that it is actually training and violence and to keep their sexual relationships and their sexuality as real. Uh, so again, another toolbox from White Ribbon has particular information about the area. Yeah? Taking a good hard look at it and keeping it real, those two key strategies which come right across uh, from violent prevention strategies internationally. So right there we've got the 10 key behaviours and then if we connect back, some of them are more on one side in terms of gender transformation or about the social means, but they certainly feed across and influence the others. So they're quite powerful in terms of the key two approaches. And also if we go, for example, this model here, again, the ecological model back to intimate partner violence, what we're talking about is right at that relationship level at that individual level, that's what's going to happen. So in terms of how we get that happening with me, I want to talk a little bit about the trans theoretical model of individual behavior change. And there's a resource which uh, you've got explains the model and the values of it and how you can find it. And the key thing around that is a model that is stages of behavior change, starting from uh, pre contemplative, which is really not interested in change. So that sense of uh, even being resistant and denying the need for change. And typically that uh, model is shown as a sort of linear progression, but actually it's probably more useful to see it as a lot more circular in terms of relapsing and needing to re-emphasize and revert things that are important. But, so the stages have changed, but the other key thing that the model does is it identifies processes that promote change at the different stages. So what would prompt me to move on to the next stage? And uh, I want to point out that it's about individual behavior change. So if you're working, for example, with mates and dates program and you're working with groups, then within that group you'll have individual men at different stages. So you need to use a cluster of strategies to move all of them along, including those that seem to be the most resistant to considering the possibility of change, and as well as those further on to reinforce that change. And there's some key ways to do that. It's about weighing up the pros and cons of behavior. So what are the benefits? Linking with personal goals. You want to develop up the efficacy. So there's the confidence and confidence that they can make changes. You want to give information alternative uh, behaviors. 
uh, an opportunity to reflect on current behaviours, what's the pros, what's the cons of that, and also to get feedback from other people. So some input about the impact of this behaviour. And they'll need support to change and building up commitment and strategies to manage risks in future. And also you want to reinforce the highlights, or the benefits rather, the pros of behaviour change as it goes on. And so if you work those strategies, you end up with a sort of series of questions that you could use, which is, you'll see it connects back with the sort of motivation that we've got. So what sort of guy do you want to be? Who are you? What's your identity? What are your values? How do you want others to see you? What's the benefit for you? What choices do you have? So choice is a bit of a theme right through here. Uh, what's not working for you? and what's holding you back at this point, and what are the things that you need to do if you want to make some changes, and what would a true mate do in this situation here. And how about giving it a go? There are just some examples of the questions. And so if you go to that resource around the transferable model, uh, there's more examples of the types of questions and, we, and comments and when they are particularly applicable at each stage. So that should give you some really richness to build strategies to work with men there and to, and that would be the thing to be working through with a professional supervisor there. And if you're working with a co-facilitator to work together on that there. And just a comment about that in terms of mates and dates program, uh, that some of those interventions are going to be stronger if it's the male facilitator that makes that for the male participants. So there's some strategies there, overall sort of theoretical approaches which should help. Uh, we also want to get that gender transformative approach happening right there and there. So you can really disrupt that man box, toxic masculinity, whatever you want to call it, by highlighting that actually gender behaviour is a choice for individual men. The, you want to talk about the dynamic of men gender policing to reinforce everyone back into the box. And you also want to yeah, also need to be mindful that men tend to be pretty conservative and resist change. That's part of that man box behaviour even though it might be very satisfying, it can be quite painful where they're at now. So there's that natural reaction against change. Talking about what the dangers are of that masculinity, and we want to encourage men to find positive role models and supportive mates. That, in fact, in terms of supporting ongoing behaviour, that'll be a significant factor. And we want to promote the traditional masculine uh, value of being courageous, stepping out, doing something new. And again, continuing to reinforce what those benefits are in terms of positive relationships, being happier and being healthier. So there's some, uh, new, all three New Zealand images. And actually I struggled to find any more of sort of positive male behavior that are used in violent prevention things. So there's a real need there in terms of getting that positive imaging to fit the positive message that we're promoting. We also need to work on the social norms and that's, we need to reinforce that most men, we need to reinforce that most men do not use violence and most men do not condone it. Most men want there to be a lot more peaceful community and for the woman in our community to be much safer. And most men will actually support intervening to stop violence. And most men actually choose their own identity and are flexible and meet with both of values. So promoting that as this is how the norm is for men is going to help. Also, if you're working with a group, for example, a mates and dates program, you want to reinforce the positive social norms that are right in that group there. That is going to be a powerful influence in the participants right here. So, so 
So it's that sense of working, the gender transformation and the social meaning. So summary, it's about being positive, using diverse strategies and messages, genuine in our, in our invitation to get involved, drawing on that motivation around the values, focus in on particular action and making it real, undermining the negative stuff and promoting the positive and doing that by focusing around the genders uh, transformation, moving beyond what we are, moving out of the man box and building on what is positive amongst men there. So that's uh, a summary of where we're at. And there's four resources that you've got. There's the original uh, issues paper about effectively involving men. There's the Tim Winton article, very powerful. And the additional resource, which is around the trans theoretical model of behavior change and processes. And then there's also a flyer, <coughs> excuse me, uh, about the White Ribbon Raise Our Men film, which you can watch on the web and which I really recommend. So, right there, hollow useful resources and that really underline the things that I've talked through. Chicken and Miriam about where we go from here. So we do have a few questions in Kia everyone. Um, firstly, thank you so much Garth for this presentation. I I got really excited on seeing it before it went live, so I'm really happy um, for you to be here. So now what we'll do is we'll open up to the panel um, and I'll leave Garth's contact details up so that people can grab yep. them and we'll stay in this format. But if anyone has any questions, please post them through now. And one first comment, it's not so much a question, but uh, it came from Katz Horaki and they say it's interesting to hear about social norms being distorted. We have attended a cultural training, cultural responsibility, and the main theme was cultural distortion from a clinical perspective and they were just noting how helpful it is to align with this co-papa so it's really good to kind of get that sense around the similarities in a clinical perspective as well as the mm -hmm. prevention perspective so QA caps hodaki um there's another question coming through and it says you say that the knowledge knowledge and empathy produce behavior change have you heard of the three myths of behavior change jenny prop uh no i haven't I'm okay. just sort of reading that. What do you think you know that you don't? Yep. Uh, no, I haven't. And, but I re really worked on the social marketing approach, which you look at anything there. And all those posters and images that I had are from social marketing campaigns. So again, aiming to change behaviour of large groups, populations. And they really, you look at them, the effective ones are around that promote, that identify and promote particular behaviour. And it's uh, getting through that um, cognitive dissonance where there's a difference between how you behave and what you think. And typically it's behavior, action, that in people align with. So, big area though, in terms of that behavior change. Thank you for that. And I think you're right in terms of there are distinctions between the what works at a general population level and what works at an individual level yeah that's um, right all things to be um, considered so we have some people are asking if they can get copies of some of the fabulous posters that you showed so if we share the powerpoint can they access those images uh yeah the, the public images and so you'll get the powerpoint and off that you'll be able to cut and co copy and cut and use those. I referred uh, to the Make Your Move Masuma, and I can let uh, Miriam know the website that they have because I've gone on to that and they've got examples of the posters that you've used across a number of years because they've changed the approaches that go on. And they also had the sister campaigns, which was basically sort of templates of some of the posters that they used. But I, I would, I know it's a bit more expensive, but I would really urge to use the approach that you see in the posters and make them local. That's really what's going to make a difference in terms of that connection with your guys. So another person asked about, there's a slide that you mentioned that most men don't condone violence. Where does that information come from? Is this a New Zealand study? It would be New Zealand based. Um, I'm 
struggling to remember exactly where it was, but I would say that it would be some of the research that the It's Not OK campaign has done, and, that, and that's available on the website. The other thing I'd say is the only... There's a lot of uh, information about the prevalence of violence, and typically that comes from who are the victims and the amount of that, and who the victims identify as perpetrators. And consistently, that's you know, 98% men. The only study that we've got in New Zealand is the Hitting Home study from 1995. So now I'm getting on pretty old. And that was interviews with men, and so it was directly asking them questions around the level of perpetration. At that stage, 20% of the men had used physical abuse against their partner in the last year. Far too high. 80% of men didn't. So right there, that's the sort of indication in terms of the proportional split. And that's if you sort of got an 80-20. A lot of things have happened uh, since then that would have affected that. And I'd really finger the rise and rise of pornography in the last 23 years to do that. And there's been these other factors which have also prevented against violence, like an increased uh, involvement of fathers in childcare and active involvement. A lot of stuff, so coming and going, but that, that kind of proportion of 80 20 sort of holds through. Uh, for example, the gender equal survey that came out last week, that's a similar sort of split in terms of men or, or people that support more flexible behavior gender behaviour and those that hold to more traditional views. It varies a little bit, but we've still always got that there and there's still always a majority who support equity. So I think it was 40%, for example, wanted or believed that men had were better in leadership roles. So 60%, the majority, didn't think that. They were a lot more open to anyone in the individual that could be a leader. So. So just a few comments have come through, just saying great presentation. So um, thank you again, Gar. And there's one question here that it was just asking if you had an opinion about the criticism some people have of campaigns which use the words real man um, and whether that can work against the desired goal of nonviolence. And if you had an opinion about that. Uh, yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't support it. It reinforces that sense of there being some real behaviour, that there's not just being a man, that's not enough. No, you've got to be a real man. So you're buying straight into that very sort of traditional masculine experience, constantly striving for an ideal which is beyond all of us, and is ridiculous, painful to us, painful to other people. So I think there's a lot better, uh, a more effective behaviour change strategy if we focus around the behaviour that we want, and I've got to say, undermining that sort of traditional masculine experience is actually a good way to do that. That uh, real men, well, easily are trumped by good men. And I'm saying that as a sort of possible expression, you know, good men in terms of a value, a shorthand description of what we want. You, you'll have your local kind of version of that as well. Okay, so we have a couple of mates and dates facilitators that have texted through. The first question is, homophobia and transphobia is still prevalent, prevalent in our schools and is a powerful way in which our boys are kept in the man box. Do you have any educational tools that you can share to help us with transforming behaviours that work across gender and sexuality issues? Or any ideas of ways of addressing that in a school? These are yeah. great questions, by the way. Really meaty. Thank you, yeah. everyone. <laughs> I didn't sort of mention that particularly when I'm on the way through, but, uh, you know, because I tend to focus about means of violence against women. But I think it's exactly that sort of conservative holding to the mailbox, punishing anyone that's outside that. So that obviously applies to women, but it also obviously applies to people that don't fit into that man box. And homosexuals are seen as that and transgender people, exactly there. So uh, I don't have any particular strategies, but other than I think this approach of transforming what men can be, or loosening up the man box, highlighting the impact of toxic masculinity on others and on yourself, if you hold to that, 
and a reinforcing of positive, encompassing values, empathy for other people, expressing values that are a lot more inclusive, uh, that that is going to touch on a whole cluster of other uh, yeah, men's violence against anybody, including other heterosexual, other real men, for the want of a better expression. Yeah. So no, nothing particular, but I'm but confident that this is actually an approach that's going to work across that. And I've got to really uh, give a good shout out to the increasing diversity in terms of gender, gender identities that we're seeing and a lot more of an inclusive response to that. Yeah, and I'm looking back over the last 20 years and uh, that, that, is a, that is a positive move that is going to be a lot healthier for a lot more people. And I know that there's a sort of male conservative resistance against that. And we may end up with sort of uh, pockets of conservative toxic masculinity where there's less exposure to difference. That's kind of one of the real contradictions around uh, that traditional masculinity that it's seen as... Uh, all powerful that have lasted for thousands of years, you know, survived, got us out of the out of the caves, got us where we are now. But yet it's so threatened by somebody acting a bit differently. So that kind of contradiction right there in terms of the mega patriarchal strength of it, but so vulnerable to some sort of slight difference. That's something that would be uh, interesting to talk about with groups of Young guys. And following on from that, probably the next question works quite well. So another Mates and Dates facilitator, regarding the idea that male privilege isn't shared and that in order to engage men, we need to be aware of divers the diversity of men. How do I, as a middle-class white guy, work to engage people that aren't like me? I think it's around recognising people have different experiences and inviting them in to share that. So not working from an assumption. I mean, that's sort of the assumption of male privilege that this is the right way and, it, and it is, if it's different, then it's wrong. So moving in terms of being inclusive and asking for different experiences and identifying and reinforcing those differences, I think is a key way. And I'm, and I'm saying this as a young sort of middle-aged Pākehā man, how to connect in with other people. But I, but I also think it's about inviting in and getting in other people, uh, other men, other diverse experiences, and, and in terms of facilitation, greater diversity of the uh, people leading a program is going to really inc increase and strengthen the diversity of participants and the reinforcing their experiences. Right, so we've got we've just opened up the last few questions. So this is a Quite a quick question back to the socio-ecological model that you showed earlier around the various influences with Fano and peers. Where do you think social media, particularly YouTube, fit in this model? I think they fit in that Fano peer sphere. So the next one out from the individual. And I say that in terms of I mean, one of the kind of buzzwords around social media is that it's about a community, and I think that's, is, which is the next level out of the ecological model. But I think that immediacy of it means that it actually has additional power, and it has the power of real people standing next to you. So I think that it, it really drives social norms and reinforces positively and negatively by social norms, so I see that it actually operates in that close, close in direct influence of behaviour. This is who I am, these are the groups that I get, these are the feeds that I get, these are the things that I'm going to listen to, these are the people like me, so I want to get with them. Yeah. It's an it's a, it's a interesting thing, isn't it, because that's sort of a... You could do the ecological model just on social media mm. because it's in a way such another world, another reality, another influence. Mm. One's just a comment. Someone commented that they loved the um, last ar article that Tim wrote on in terms of that you shared in terms of resources and that they have shared it broadly. So Great. if that person can reshare it with me, I can add it to the information with this webinar. And then the last one at the moment that we have is 
thinking about how at times um, we end up being defensive between us as men and women as workers doing this work. So while we're doing public facing prevention, it's great and very necessary, but how do we do better with each other internally in the sector? Another meaty question that I think we could end our presentation on. <laughs> <laughs> That's another presentation there. Yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, well, question. yeah, I'm gonna, I mean, uh, it's such a big thing. I'm kind of thinking about how to grab hold of it. Uh, one way would be to come back to, uh, and I'm talking to the men that are working in the sector, you've got a really powerful role. When you're working in something like Mates and Dates, your voice for the men in that participant, uh, the, that are participating in that group, that is strong. And I think in terms of working collegially with uh, women, that it comes back to the sort of things that I've talked around there in terms of being true to the values, having empathy. Uh, some of the things I haven't talked around would be about being assertive and still being clear about where things are at. Uh, and so having that sort of strong contribution as well. I think that we need to, and I'm thinking of the mindful of the whole you know, Me Too campaign, you know, a consistent thing that's starting to come through now is about how men can support that and be allies to that and a key part of that is actually shutting up and listening. And I think I'd add on to that feeling it as well and sometimes you know it's a fraught issue you know that men do perpetrate most violence and the most severe hurting violence with the most negative consequences for women so it's about acknowledging that it is and sometimes just living with that and that sometimes we're individual that's standing up to do something different from that, but also in the end, you know, we sometimes are symbols, totems, targets. And I think I'll end with a, you know, something I read the other week, which is, uh, you know, we should be lucky that uh, women are only asking for equality, you know, because I'd be surprised they should not asking for revenge. And uh, I'll leave it there. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was a, an amazing presentation and I think testament to how amazing it was was the gruntiness of the questions that people came through and common theme from the chat and the questions was how great people found it. So thank you. Thank you again. It's been um, really nice to actually experiment our first webinar with you. <laughs> so and I'm really excited that this information now can go broadly. So Yeah, and I, and I really enjoyed working on this and yeah, I really want to happy and support all the good work that is happening out there. Mm. And uh, yeah, kaha. Yeah, kaha. So if you want to get involved more, we will be having a online space for men in the sector to be able to connect. So if you aren't already linked in with Tuanets in any way, you can go and like our Facebook page. You can email me at tawiwiprevention at toa-ness.org.nz. You can also email me if you're not part of your, our usual mailing list and you want to make sure that you get the, all the details and information from this webinar. So um, I'm really happy to be contacted. And apart from that, we're going to end today. We're going to also end by thanking Helen Baxter, who was very active in, um, our, in our chat and helping us out. I'll just turn the camera on her so you can get to meet her. Hi, everyone. Um, Helen Baxter is from Mohawk Media, and she's been supporting us today in our first webinar to solve any tech issues. So sure that everyone. And that is the end of our presentation today. We will be doing another one in July at the around term break. The dates are already there and we're just confirming who the next webinar presenter will be. So apart from that, thank you very much everyone and we will see you next time. <laughs>